Tractate Chul in chapter 5, uh, the name of the chapter is Oisoi ve'es benoi, him and his son, the laws of not uh, shechting the mother with, uh, with its offspring. So, Beseva, Filu Mikso said they disagree, the Gemara says they disagree in the term se, includes even a part se, Rabbonon Savri, se, Filu Mikso se, Rabbonon Savri, se, Filu Mikso se. So, that's how we ended off yesterday, that the rabbis hold that se includes even a part se, uh, even if it's, if it's a, a hybrid, Rabbonon Savri, se, Filu Mikso se, Rabbonon hold that se ex- exclude part of a se, meaning it has to be completely or it's either all or nothing. So the Gemara proceeds to explain how this dispute applies to each of the issues discussed above, the laws of Oisoi ves benoi, covering the blood and the gift portions. Omar Rav Papa. Rav Papa said, Ilkach, therefore, Le'inyan kisu adomu matonis, regarding the laws of covering the blood and giving the gift portions to a Kohen. Covering the blood and giving the gift portions to a Kohen. Lo'im ashkachas labet zviya bo'alat yosho, you can't, you can't find the previously cited discussions would be applicable except with respect to a koi produced, how this koi was produced, an animal called koi, and it's produced by a male deer that mated with a female goat. A deer with a goat. The goat was a female and the deer was the male. And they came together and they have a child and the child's name is koi. Okay, we're calling him koi. Meaning koi means Happiness. that it's a hybrid. Yeah, it can happen that uh, a deer, which is a an un- non-domesticated animal, <coughs> breeds with a domesticated animal. <laughs> For both the rabbis and Rabbi Lezer are, cer- are uncertain whether we concern ourselves with the father's seed, and consider the offspring part deer and part say, meaning if I'm considering the seed of this, the, um, the deer, then the, this koi is part deer, part se, part uh, goat. Or do we not concern ourselves with the father's seed and consider the offspring entirely a se? We follow the mother, like the mother. So do we follow the mother and we ignore the father? That's the uncertainty. Or we completely uh, ignore the father. Meaning we ignore the father and then I say, I follow the mother. Or, or I say, I'm, I'm, there are two partners here. And therefore it's half deer, half se. And they, the rabbis and Rabbi Lezer, Chachom and Rabbi Lezer disagree whether the term se includes even a part se. The rabbis hold that any law stated regarding a certain species applies even to hybrids that are partially of the species. Rabbi Lezer holds that it does not. Regarding covering the blood, the interpretation is as follows. A koi produced by a male deer and a female goat may be considered part deer. For possibly we concern ourselves with the father's seed. According to the rabbis, therefore, it may be subject to having its blood covered. It may, however, be exempt since we do not concern ourselves with the father's seed. It is not considered a deer at all. So we're obviously this machlokes has uh, ramifications. And the ramifications are, what do you do with the chalev? Are you allowed to eat the chalev or not? If you're saying that it's a part deer, so maybe you'll be allowed to because part of it is a deer and the chalev of deer is permitted, the, the fat of a deer is permitted. But if you say it's not, then it's prohibited. Let's go to the Gemara. Of Papa continues, Regarding the law of it and its offspring, you can find the dispute mentioned above. Both with respect to a koi produced by a male goat that mated with a female deer, and with respect to a koi produced by a male deer that mated with a female goat where it is considered a, a se maternally, because follow the mother. Taisha bala tzivyo, or the tzivyo would be, in the first case he mentions a koi that was produced by a goat mating with a deer, or the other way around, deer mated with a female goat. Betaisha bala tzivyo leisura, with respect to a koi produced by a male goat mated with a female deer, 
it can be considered a se only paternally. The, meaning the father is a goat. The dispute pertains to, to the issue of whether one is prohibited in the first place to slaughter it and its offspring on the same day. The Rabbonans of Ridil Machoshin Lezerab, for the rabbis hold that perhaps we concern ourselves with the father's seed. And furthermore, the rabbis hold that we say that the say includes even a part say. Since the hybrid might be considered part say by virtue of its paternity, it is possibly subject to the prohibition of Oyes of Esbenoi. And it is prohibited out of doubt of slaughter the koi and its offspring on the same day. So we have a, a concern, are we allowed, it says you're not allowed to shech the mother and its offspring on the same day. Now what happened if it's a, a hybrid? Um, is the law still applies to a hybrid or to koi of oisov es benoi? I have a question with the donkey. Would the deer understand, because deer is kosher to eat the chol, the chalat. but what about the donkey? What do we have to know the donkey? If it's, if it's hybrid or not. No, no, the donkey we just bought, uh, we, the Gemara just bought an example with, uh, when we spoke about the donkey, the Gemara bought an example with when, when it's, uh, if you're allowed to have kilaim. Meaning, if you have a donkey that came from a horse, the father was a horse, and the mother was a donkey. And now they produced one kind. And then we'll take another couple that it's the opposite. Let's say the father was a donkey and the mother was a horse and they have a son. Can, am, I, am I allowed to breed them together? Only for this? We, Obviously, we are, we're, okay. not, we're not going to eat the donkey, okay, but okay. Uh, I'm allowed to, to breed them. I was confused, okay. So, it, what, what, so if I'm allowed to breed them, that means that it doesn't make a difference. Father or mother, they're both still the same. But if I'm not allowed to breed them, we see that there is a distinction between what the mother is and what the father is. Okay, thank you. Even if it is presumed that we do not concern ourselves with the father's seed, the hybrid would be considered no more than a half a se. And we do not say that se includes even a part se. The law of it and its offspring surely does not apply to the koi. And that's really what we're trying to find out. And that was the Mishnah. What, when the Torah says, Oy Soves Beno, how far does it go? Does it extend also to a koi? So far we see that it's not. With respect to a koi produced by a male deer that mated with a female goat, he has a, he has a, a ah, off, if I broke off. Yeah. Where, so. What happened? He lost the screw? But it wouldn't no, help it you anyway, because no, you can't I, put it back, can't put it together. No, I can't. I, I don't know where it's a screw. No, a piece of plastic? No, this. No, this. Yeah, the piece of plastic. Oh, uh, the yeah. car, you got, you, you can't screw whoever, or don't put another one. I don't know no, the is. whole piece broke, even the metal that holds it. Oh, uh, I it, don't know. Then we got problems. Time for new goggles. It's all in the hands of guard. Right? Yeah. yeah. I don't even know where it is. Okay. I just I know it is. Okay. Might be able just to buy a frame without the lenses. The frames yeah. are the money. The frame. This, the other way this, around, no? No. People, the, the frames is what costs money. Yeah, the true. glass How much doesn't is the cost frame? anything. I have to get new glasses anyway, but... Yeah. Yeah. You need an ophthalmologist. Right. Stand up. Forget so it. Forget it. Forget, it. Forget it. Forget about it. No. Let's continue. Maybe but Tzviya, okay. about Yoshua it says, and with respect okay. to a koi okay. produced fine. male deer that mated with a female goat, where it is considered a se maternally, the dispute pertains to the issue of whether lashes are incurred by one who slaughters it and its offspring on one day. So if he shechted such a hybrid or koi, is he, and shechted the mother and the baby, is he, is he liable to malchus, yeah, to lashes? The rabbis are concerned that concern, we are concerning ourselves. We do concern ourselves with the father's seed. 
this is uh, and that the koi is therefore considered part dear by virtue of its paternal lineage and only part se by virtue of its maternal lineage this is irrelevant for seva we say that se includes even a part se and accordingly the prohibition of oyster as benoi definitely applies to the koi so in, in, in simple words, if we concern ourselves with the father's seed, then we have a se over here. And if we have a se, the law of oisov es benoi kicks in or applies to, the, to, the, to this case. Umalkinan. And thus we impose lashes on, the, on uh, the one who slaughters the koi and its offspring. There is a prohibition. You shouldn't do it, but there is no lashes. Isura ika. There is a prohibition against slaughtering them and in the first place because perhaps we do not concern ourselves with the father's seed. And this, is a, and this core is therefore considered a full say. If I'm not considering this, the father's seed, this is for sure a say. When I'm considering the father's seed, I'm saying the father's seed was, it's there. And therefore it's a koi. Now it's a, the father is a deer, the mother is a goat and it, it's a mixture. But if I'm ignoring the father, I'm only looking at the mother, then it's 100% the same. And therefore, uh, the, laws of, the law of Ois of Esbenoi applies. Then it's a say, Malchus Leica, but there are no lashes imposed. Ex post facto, on one who slaughters them on the same day. Because perhaps we do concern ourselves with the father's seed. And the core is considered part dir and part se. And according to Rabbi Lezer, we do not say that se includes even a part se, since there is a possibility that the law of Oisov has been known does not apply to this koi. We cannot impose lashes on the slaughter ex post facto. Meaning that after the fact, we do not impose. Uh, to, to say that it's okay, we're not going to tell you it's okay, you shouldn't do it. But if you did it, you're not going to be liable to. to uh, and now, I just want to read the summary in the bottom. We have, uh, it, just to sum up the, the issues that we're discussing, there were three uh, ramifications, uh, meaning that three nafkuminas that comes along in this uh, suge, in this discussion. Number one is the Ois of Esbenoi, if you are prohibited to shech the mother and the son. And uh, number two, within of Esbenoi, if you liable to lashes or not, right? So according Koi, the born from a male goat and a female deer. So the female is the non-domesticated one and the goat is a domesticated one. The rabbis say the slaughter is forbidden initially, but no Marcos. Rabbi Lezer said the slaughter is permitted. of Esbenoi is permitted with such mixture of a Koi that the a father is a goat, the mother is a deer. And koi that was born the other way around to a male deer and a female goat that we usually follow the mother, right? The mother is the dominant one. So it says you're not allowed to slaughter. And if you did, you incur, you're, you're incurring malchus. That's according to Chachomim. According to Rabelezer, the slaughter is forbidden, but no malchus. So we see Rabelezer is more lenient when it comes to Ois of Esbenon. Now, when it comes to gift portions, we know that you have to give gift to the coin. Um, if you have a coin, do you need to give gift to the coin or you don't give gift to the coin? Because it's a coin, it's not a regular uh, say that the Torah speaks about. Shoyer oise, the Torah says, an ox or a sheep. And this is either or. No, no, it says, uh, it says a crime, a keva, the, uh, the bamzem and the foreleg was given as a gift to the coin. So the question is, According to the rabbis, the owner is exempt since it's a koi. When, when uh, the father was a male goat and it was a female deer, according to the rabbis, he's exempt. According to Rabbi Lezer, also is exempt. And in, in, in the other way around, if the father was a deer and the mother was a goat, according to the rabbis, you, st you have to give half to the koi, meaning half of what you would usually give because it's half a se, half a deer. Mm -hmm. And according to Rabbi Lezer, he's still exempt. One now fourth. in... One, one fourth? One quarter? No, no, half of it. Half of a half? Yes, you, no, you only, what do you need to give? 
the foreleg and the, and the stomach, let's say, right? So uh, assuming it's 10 pounds of, of meat, so you only give five pounds. Oh, okay. Okay. Now, uh, regarding Kisu Adam, in a case of a male goat and a female deer, according to the rabbis, it's definitely required and also permitted on Yom Tov. According to Rabbi Lezer, it's required out of a doubt, but it's forbidden on Yom Tov. And in the other way around, if it was a male deer and a female goat, it's required out of doubt and it's forbidden on Yom Tov, according to the rabbis and according to Rabbi Lezer, it's not required and slaughtering permitted on Yom Tov. So that's uh, pretty much regarding that sugya. Having clarified the opinions of Rabbi Lezer and the rabbis, who defined the koi as a hybrid creature produced through the union of a goat and deer. The Gemara cites uh, dissenting views. Omar of Yehuda, koi birya bifneatzmahi, the koi is an independent creature, not one that is produced through cross bidding. That's the, the, the beginning, what I had in mind of a koi, that it's an, an animal that the rabbis were not sure if it's domesticated or not domesticated. After it's born. You have an animal, you go to the desert, you find this, this animal and you're not sure how to classify it. Am I classifying it as an animal or am I classifying it as chaya? What is it? Chaya or behema? Chaya is the non-domesticated and behema is the domesticated one. Like ayala, for example, a deer. A deer is not a domesticated animal. It's found in the wild, right? In yeah, the, in the forest. It's but kosher. It's we're not talking about the kashus. Well, kashus mean, is something else. We're talking mean, about how to classify it and why is it important how I classify it? Because if I classify it as chaya, then I don't, I allow to eat the chilev and I, I don't have to bring portions to the coin. Yeah. If I classify it as a behema, then I, I'm not allowed to eat the chilev and I classify, and, and then I have to, uh, to give gift to the coin. And kisu adam. So, Chachamim said, koi birya atzmo. The koi is an independent creature, not one that is, uh, up till now we learned that what is a koi, it's a product of crossbreeding. But now he's saying a koi is a chabif na'atzmo, it has his own identity. And the sages could not determine whether it is species of behema or species of chaya. Rav Nachman, Omar, koi ze ayl habar. So Rav Nachman says, what is a koi? I'll tell you what it is. It's called ayl habar, the wild ram. And a Tanoic dispute in regards to, uh, uh, in this regard, is cited because Tanoic, in this matter is of Tanoic dispute. Koi ze ayl habar, the koi is the wild ram. Ve'ashremim ze abam in atay shum But some say that what is a koi is a product of a goat, and a deer that made it. Abiyo Yisrael, me koi birya b'fnatzmai. The koi is an independent creature. Velo yichiru b'chachomim min chayim beima. When the rabbis, the sages, could not determine whether it is species of beima or species of chayim. Rabbi Shimon Gamliel Leimer min beima. Rabbi Shimon Gamliel said it is species of beima. And the people of the house of Dosai used to raise many breed, many breeds or many herds of them. They had a lot of them. So according to Rabbi Shimon Gamliel, it was considered behema, the koi. The Gemara turns to another creature whose classification is in question. Amar Rabbi Zeira, Amar Rav Safra, Amar Rav Nuna, uh, Rabbi Zeira said in the name of Rav Safra, who said in the name of Rav Nuna, Those creatures known as forest goats are fit for offering on the altar. Forest goats, it says forest goats, but they were still fit uh, for offering on the and altar. Usually, that's not the, the case. Usually, uh, Forest goat, meaning a goat that you find in the forest. forest. Yeah? In the Amazonas, you, you go there, you find the uh, goats. Because According to Rabbi Zeira, you're allowed to, you're allowed to use them on the Mizbeach. That's a Kiddush, right? Of course. It's a big Kiddush. I saw the goats. But they consider Behemoth? No. Obviously, if they're allowed to, then it's Behemoth, yeah. yeah. And they go down, how do they do it? 
Torah, it says in 14, the Torah allows only behemot, specifically cattle, sheep, and goats, but not chayot to be offered on the altar. It's kasher, but not to be offered on the altar. Rabbi Bnuna asserts that the forest goat is a species of behemot, and therefore it may be offered on the altar. Similarly, it is subject to the laws of oisov es benoi and gift portions, and is excluded from the requirement of kisra adom. The forest goat would be would seem to be ibex. Would seem to be the ibex. The so if you, ibex is, is a type of an animal. Maybe you can Google it. Show them the picture of the ibex. I b e x. It's a type of a mountain goat. Ibex. Mountain goat. Mountain goat. Yeah. yeah, the horns like this, I think. I think mountain goats they climb the mountains. I don't know. They mm -hmm. do. Saw a lot of them. Uh, what did you see? In 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 Israel, there's there's a lot there. It's, it's the uh, the the fountain in Gedi. There's a lot of them. Right in Gedi, yeah. It's yeah. But this is not, these are mountain goats, and he's talking about forest goats. It's, mm -hmm. it's a forest goat sounds like something more similar to a deer. What is in, what is in the forest? I'm surprised they didn't put in your Gemara, Rabbi Yaakov. Usually they put pictures. Uh, Maybe they put a picture of a forest goat. Oh, no? no? That's the mountain one. But if you if you Google forest goat, I'm curious forest. what the picture will, uh, what what are the pictures will come up? This subject. Wow. And Hashem is so perfect that He made us different from all the other species. That when he, they try to make, you uh, said 23 chromosomes versus yeah, 62. They tried to to mate humans with monkeys, with injections, injections, okay. and they couldn't. They couldn't. Why? Yeah. The, the chromosomes of the monkey kill us, they kill us, they kill our chromosomes. So it's impossible to a human mate with an animal, and the animals can do it by themselves. And what about if they would take the, chrom the, the seed the of... It doesn't work. The seed of man, put it into oh, the into monkey, the, monkey, the it chimpanzee. Work. It doesn't, it doesn't work. work. Uh -huh. They try it. How many chromosomes does a monkey have? <laughs> I don't know, I didn't check. There's an interesting note here, can I read it? Sure. It's quite sure it helps. Uh, when it says, Eser Bahama Mana Akatuv, it says, out of all the domesticated and undomesticated animals in the world, only the 10 species listed in the Torah are permitted for consumption. Of those 10, there are three species of domesticated animals, the ox, the sheep, and the goat, and there are seven species of, of chayot, of undomestic animals, the deer, the gazelle, the fallow deer, the wild goat, so it's listing the wild goat, yeah. not calling it a forest goat. The uh, uh, oryx, the aruchos, and the wild sheep. This ruling is in accordance with the statement of Rabbi Yitzchak yeah. from the Ramba. We have 23 and the monkey is 24. It's interesting, this forest goat is not mentioned here. Right, so Sovar Lokior, the Amar Witzchak, Esr Beimus Muna Akosu Vesu Loi. So, scriptures, are you saying that there are only 10 Beimus? Scripture counted for us 10 species of kosher animals, and there are no more. The Gemara says there got to be more. Vehoni, Rav Amnuna, therefore, reasons regarding these forest goats, we know that they are kosher, for they have split hooves and they chew their cod. Right? And since scripture does not list them among the kosher chayos, we learn from this that if they're not mentioned, probably they're under the same category of a goat. I know it's saying it's a cow-like creature with the glossy coat of a horse and the agility of a goat and the long horns of an antelope characterizes a cow that lives the life of a goat. Cow that lives the life of a goat. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like our generation today. <laughs> <laughs> Hence, uh, they may be offered on the altar. Maskif lo ravacha bar Yaakov. They put a picture. I'm curious to see a picture of it. Ravacha bar Yaakov objected to this, and he says, "Ve'im ayol utzvi perat." Cow that lives the life of a goat. It's like a goat. Oh. Cow doesn't play cow. How does that happen? <laughs> wow, it looks like it, it looks to me like um, a mixture of a goat and a sheep. Because the really that's scary. <laughs> uh, it's 
got a little bit of uh, the chef the, soleil. Yeah. Right. The, uh, no, there's not almost really. nothing you could do. Yeah. Has the what taste? I don't like see cow. nothing. You a cow. cow. You don't see a cow. I just see a goat and a little like sheep. Uh, sheep? Because it's the the wool in the back. It looks like a little bit uh, yeah, yeah, no, well, that's curly. Because the friendly. goat is straight and and they right. The sheep has curly. Right. This one looks more like a sheep. Tell me, you tell Hazak. Yeah, this looks like mountain goat. Yeah, that, uh, that all related. Matki for Rabbi Yaakov, objected. Ve'ayel, ve'imayel, utsvi prat. And I can say in, in the pasuk listing the kosher animals, the post, the phrase at heart, deer, constitutes specification. Kol be'imaklal, and the phrase. So we have a klal uprat. Ayel, utsvi, and the Torah says ayel, utsvi, prat. Kol beima, when the Torah says kol beima, it's a klal, it's a generalization. Prat uchlal, where you have a specification and a, general, and a generalization, nasa klal musaf ala prat. The generalization becomes an addition to the prat, to the specification. Ikatuva, perhaps there are many other species of animals that are not listed in the verse, yet kosher. Accordingly, the forest goat maybe an independent species of Chaya and unfit for being offered on the altar. What was his uh, argument? Rabbi Zera's argument is that since there are you telling me there are 10 species and this one is not mentioned, so yeah. it, he said it's not mentioned because it falls under the category of a goat. So the answer the Gemara says no, it's not mentioned because there's a lot of things that are not mentioned. The Torah decided to mention 10 of them, <coughs> but there are many that are not mentioned because the Torah gave us the identification marks, chewing its card and having a split hooves. It doesn't mean that the Torah mentioned everything and it's very possible that this forest goat is a chaya. So why do I need all those specifications in the verse? Ayil tzvi. Oh. So the Gemara says, Maskif lo ravach ebrei de rav ika, ravach ha son of ika objected to this, v'dil mamino de'aku ninu. But perhaps forest goats are of the species of Akko. Akko is also mentioned in the Torah, which the verse lists among the Chayas. It says in 20, Akko is an obscure species whose identity we don't know. Perhaps this is in fact the creature that people call the forest goat. So there's a possibility that Akko is the forest goat. Amale Ravach Avredi Ravel Ravashi. Why? Hybrid <laughs> The male has long curving horns, while the female has shorter horns. Is it ibex or ibex? Oh, ibex. Ibex. Yeah. Ibex. Yeah. 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 So, Amor leRavacha the Amor leRavacha bereide Ravavio leRavashi. Shmuel, why not correcting him? It was just me. What? <laughs> 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 he, he said ibex. <laughs> 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 he said ibex. He didn't correct him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they trained you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and some say that it was Ravacha, the son of Rav Avio, who said to Ravashi, Dilma mina de sou, o mina de zemer ninu. The Torah mentioned tow, uh, soyu, zemer, ako. Perhaps forest goat are of the species of tow or the species of zemer, which are also listed among the Chayos. Isn't he, in Hebrew, is it a tow, a, a buffalo? It says over here in, in twenty. I just read it, that ako, Chavez, Chavez. Uh, it, it says that it's an obscure species whose identity we do not know. What is the Torah in Hebrew? Akko. No, I'm saying the Torah doesn't... Uh, Torah itself, you asked me about uh, Akko. Uh, Torah, it says... Uh, I, I, just, I think I remember. The precise identity of this species is also unknown. Rashi says it's unknown. The, the, the species of Zemer and Toyu. Or Soyu. So over here he says like this that that there's a Latin name for for the toe. It's called a bos primigenius. 
The animal was approximately three millimeters in length with a height of almost two millimeters. It was black and known for its great strength. Another suggestion as to the identity of the biblical toe is the European bison, which bison is a buffalo. Right. אמר לרב חונו לרב אשי, המימר שורי תרביו, המימר פרמידד, רב חנן, סטר רב אשי, המימר פרמידד דה חלב אוף פורסט גוט פור קונסומפשן, מינינג דה איטס חיו, דה איטס הווילד אנדמסטיקייטד, ודאטס וואי פרמידד את, וואי סי דה הוא דפנטלי קונסידר דהם חייס. אי פרדר דיסקושן אוף דיס מטר איז סיידד באו מיני מאבא וברי דה רב בנימין ברכיה מרבונה ברכיה אבא דה סנוב בר מין יומין ברכיה אינקווייד אוב רבונה ברכיה הני איזה דה וולו דוס קריצ'ר נון אז פורסט גוט מה עולה גב המזבח? וואט איז דה לא ורספקט או אופרינג דהם און דה אולטר אומר לעד כאן ליפלי גבי יוסי ורבונון סופה רבי יוסי אין דה ואבא אז דיד נאט דיס אגרי אלא בשיר הבור, אקספט רגארדינג דה ווילד אוקס. דה סנן, דה סנן פור ווי לורט אין דה מישנה, שיר הבור מין בהמה, הוא דה ווילד אוקס איז אי ספישיז אוף בהמה. בופלו, כן? שיר הבור, או איטס א ווילד אוקס. קוד בי דה בופלו איז נאט שיר הבור, אבל קוד בי דה דה ווילד. אתה יכול למצוא את זה מאוד פשוט, תלכו לבית הפלוי על קינגסטון אביניו. אתה יכול לראות שיר הבור. עכשיו הם עשו את זה ברנד, ברנד של כושר מיד, הם קוראים לזה שיר הבור. But really, it, what it means, it's the wild ox. It could be that it's a buffalo, I'm not sure. It could be just, uh, what do they call them? Uh, wildebees. Wildebees. Willowbees. Willowbees. Yeah, willowbees. So, uh, who knows? Willowbees are in Australia. That looks like a buffalo, that yeah, one. Yeah, it does. Yeah. A little tiny one, right? So, they were extinct. Some say they were extinct. What about these oxes they use in, the, in Spain that run after people? Those are not extinct. The bulls, right? The bulls. Those are bulls. 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 And those that are stabbed. Yeah, they, they, they sit there and stab. In put arenas. Spears in them. And they chase people and they keep stabbing until they die. No, I thought that, I thought that he just uh, showed them the red flag. So oh. he gets crazy and then they run yeah. up. The At red the flag end. is the beginning. Yeah. Behind the red flag, there, there's, a, there's a knife like this size. And they're stabbing them. So they put in here. And the last one, and then they put and then very the deep here. Then the, then the, the, the bull fell down. And then they cut the, cut the, cut the ears. To show it was people. a good cartoon movie. Like it's that. the worst. It's, uh, the worst thing. Yeah. Spanish people Sao, are Sao the worst people. They're all the worst people. Sao Sao people. Sao they call it art. Art? Yeah. So, and, and those uh, doing the rodeo, what are they using? What type of... Uh, Oxen. Rodeo is different. Spears, Rodeo is different. Bulls. It's, it's bulls too, but they're bulls. squeezing bulls. the downstairs. So With the legs. Yeah, they, they tighten their stuff, make it, and then the bulls are going crazy. And that's, ah, because of that. Yeah, I think. and that's why they try to see who can stay on it the longest while it's like suffering the most. And before they're going to the arena? <laughs> so it's also a uh, Tzawa Lechaim. It's terrible. Right? I was in a market in Spain, and there, the, the fishes are alive. The... Lagosta. Lobster. They are alive, they're suffering there with the hands like this. And I told the guy, throw to the, the beach, to the, 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 the sea again. The, the animal is suffering here. And he, he goes to me like this, uh, are you in, in, in pain because of them? Buy them and you throw them. They don't yeah. have It's interesting that Rabbi Moshe Feinstein posting that veal is sorry, balay chayim. In other words, because it's a little animal, It's kept in a pen its whole life, and it never gets any sunlight, it never gets any exercise, and they feed it a diet of, with high content of iron, so it's, so it's basara, so its meat will be white and fat, and it never has any life in existence. He didn't say that it was asr, but he said it was sarabali chayim. And, uh, and uh, many people were very upset with that because they liked veal. You can buy veal that is free range. Uh, not sure. suffering. Because this is called baby veal. In other words, where they, uh, they don't... That they, they close they, it. They keep it in a, in a keep cage. Keep it in a cage, yeah. It's torture. It's 
that na and shira bo min beima, who the wild ox is a species of beima. Rabbi Yaisi, Rabbi Yaisi says min chaya. It is a species of chaya. The Rabbon and Savrei, the basis of their dispute is that the rabbis hold me disargamin and tubulo. Since Targum Unculus translate the name of this creature as Turbela, forest ox. Mina de Behema, we learned the wild ox is a species of Behema like the ordinary ox. Rabbi Yesi Sova, but Rabbi Yesi holds that me the Kachoshi Levadi Chayas in scripture list this creature among the Chayas. Mina de Chayo, we learned that it is a species of Chayo. It is only in the respect that Rabbi Yesi and the rabbis disagree. Our honey, but as for these forest goats, divra kol mina de'ezin, who all agree that they are a species of goat. They are fit to be offered on the altar. Rav Huna Barchia's reasoning is challenged. Maskev la Ravach Abrei de Ravika, Ravach, the son of Ravika, objected to this. Vedil mamino de Akri Ninu, but perhaps forest goats are of the species of Akri, which the verse does list among the highest. Omar le Ravina le Ravashi, Ravina hold, Ravina said to Ravashi, Vedil mamino de Sermina de Zemarinu, perhaps forest goats are of the species of Teyu, or toyu, or, tho, or, or soyu, or, or of the species of zemer, which are the uh, which are highest. The Gemara cites an Amaira who conclusively disagrees with Rav Huna Barchia. Omar Rav Nachman, Omar Le Rav Hanan, Le Rav Ashi, a member showed it by a member permitted the chelav of forest goats for consumption. We see that he considered them highest. If you can eat the chelav, they are highest. Ketzad. The Mishnah stated, How so? If an animal and its offspring are slaughtered on the same day. Omar Rabbi Yishaya. Kula Masnisin the Lake Rabbi Shimon. The entire Mishnah that we learned does not accord with the opinion of Rabbi Shimon. Mimai. From what statement of the Mishnah do I deduce this? Midekatani. For, for since the Mishnah states, that if the animal and its offspring that are slaughtered on, the, on, on one day, kochim bachutz, are both kochim and are slaughtered outside the temple courtyard. Orish and chai of chorus, the first slaughter is liable to chorus. Ushneim psulim, both of the animals are unfit. Ushneim sevgimis arboim, and both of the slaughterers incurs, incur the 40 lashes of Malkis. The first slaughterer, the shaykhet, is liable to chorus because he slaughtered an offering outside the courtyard. The second slaughterer, however, is not liable to chorus because since it is prohibited to slaughter an animal and its offspring on one day, and one of them had already been slaughtered, the second was unfit to be offered. So in a way, it wasn't kochim, because right now it wasn't fit to be offered. Mikdi now... It before it's eight years old, right? It would also not be ruined, right? For Correct, yeah. Anything yeah. That, that... No, but the Mishnah, the, the scenario that the Mishnah gave was the two of them are kochim. Right. The mother and the son. Right. And the, since he shechted the mother outside, is liable to chorus. Right. For shechting it outside. Now, the one that shechted the son is not liable to chorus, but he's liable for for doing it for uh, shechting the mother and the son the same day. He's not liable on the account of Kochim, he's liable on the account of Oisir Vez Benoy. Mikdei, and that's why it says, Shneim Seif Gimes Arboim, that both of them are, are, are liable to lashes. Mikdei Shamina Le Rabbi Shimon De Omar, we have heard Rabbi Shimon say that Shechit HaShein Ruyo Lo Lishma, Shechita she'ena ru'uya, lo yishma shechita. A shechita that is not done properly, it's not considered shechita. Don't call it shechita. It's killing. A slaughter that is not fit, that does not render the animal fit for consumption, is not termed shechita. Because what is the purpose of shechita? To create the meat fit for consumption. Right. And, if, uh, and if you didn't do it, then it's not shechita, it's something else. 
So, mm -hmm. so then also that And then you're that, that, from the Avera. And you would also be potter from Chusui Hadam. Yeah, but maybe you're liable to killing animal for no reason. That. Unless, you, unless your intention was to, to do it properly and something happened. According to Rabbi Shimon opinion, the first animal of Kochim that was slaughtered outside the temple courtyard was in, in effect killed without being slaughtered. The second animal, which is the parent or offspring of the first, is acceptable as an offering inside the temple on that very day. Why then does the Mishnah impose only Malchus on the second slaughter? Let him also be liable to cause. He said, since you shechted the animal that was supposed to be inside, Kochim, you shechted it outside, you didn't shecht it, you killed it. And therefore, you're allowed to shecht the son, because Oisav is is only if you shecht it properly, mm. if it was shechita. So therefore, the second animal is considered Kochim, because there's no Oisav es benoi. Right, yeah. because it wasn't shechita for the first one. He's not considering it shechita. So therefore, the second one should be liable to chorus. And that's the, the Gemara's question. Another proof, chulin b'fnim. Chulin are slaughtered inside the temple courtyard. Shneem psulin. Both of them are unfit because chulin slaughtered in the courtyard are prohibited for benefit. Vashin, you say, boom in the second uh, and the second slaughterer incurs the 40 lashes of Malchus for violating the prohibition of Oisov es Benoi. Mikdi. Now let us see. Shamina leil Rabbi Shimon de Omar Shechita she'en ruuya. Lo yishma Shechita. We have heard from Rabbi Shimon say that a slaughter that is not fit, that does not render the animal fit for consumption, is not termed Shechita. He shechted it inside the courtyard and therefore uh, we said that it's possible, the, the, the meat is unfit. So, according to Rabbi Shimon, it's not considered shechita. Kama miktal katle, accordingly, the first animal of Hulin that was slaughtered in the courtyard was in fact killed without being slaughtered. Shani, am I Why then does the second slaughter cause the 30 lashes? According to Rabbi Shimon, there was no slaughter of an animal and its offspring on, on one day. As this uh, segment of the Mishnah also does not accord with Rabbi Shimon. Yet another proof, Kochim Bifnim, furthermore, the Mishnah states that if the animal and its offspring are both Kochim and are slaughtered inside the courtyard, Horisha and Koshu Fotu, the first animal is fit and its slaughter is not liable. Whereas the second slaughterer incurs the 40, mal the 40 malchus lashes and his, his animal is unfit. Mikti. Now let us see. We have heard from Rabbi Shimon that a slaughter that is not fit, that does not render the animal fit for consumption, is not termed a shechita. Shechita skochim nami. Shechita shen A reason. And reason dictates, logic dictates that the slaughter of Kochim too is always considered a slaughter that is not fit. Why? The Since even after an offering is slaughtered, as long as its blood is not thrown upon the altar, the meat is not permitted for consumption. So it's not, we said, what is Shechita? Shechita is that you're shechting the animal and it renders the meat fit. But when you're shechting for kochim, it doesn't, doesn't render the meat fit. Once yes. you apply the blood, then the meat is, is fit. So this is not a proper shechita. Because wow. what is shechita has to make the meat fit. But it didn't make the meat fit for consumption. I need to throw the blood so the kohanim now can eat the meat. Why then the Mishnah ruled that the second slaughterer incurs the 40 lashes and his animal is unfit. Clearly this segment of the Mishnah is also inconsistent with Rabbi Shimon's opinion. Perforce we learn from this that the entire Mishnah does not accord with the opinion of Rabbi Shimon. The Gemara says, Pshito de'ochi, so it is obvious that this is so. What does Rabbi Yishayo mean to inform us? 
The Gemara answers, Shechitas Kochi Mitzvah Chale. It was necessary for Rabbi Yishai to inform us the final point about the slaughter of Kochi. Sal Kadat Tachamina Shechitas Kochi Mitzvah Chale. Uyuyi, it might have entered your mind to say that the slaughter of Kochim is in fact considered a slaughter that is fit. <laughs> For if one tears open an offering and then throws its blood upon the altar, its meat is not permitted for consumption. What did he do? He tears open an offering and then throws its blood upon the altar. He first should, should have thrown the blood and then uh, tears the meat and then it, and tears it open. And it has to be the clay showers. Clay showers, yes. So it's yeah. then uh, its meat is not permitted for consumption. Whereas when one uh, slaughters an offering and then throws its blood, the meat is permitted. Then there is room for the thought that the slaughter of Kochim is considered a slaughter that is fit. And Rabbi Shimon considers Kochim subject to the law of it and its offering. Rabbi Yishai therefore informs us that this is not so. Rather, since in the case of Kochim, the slaughter itself does not immediately permit the meat, it is always considered a slaughter that is unfit. Rabbi, do they have the... Uh like a blood vessel that ca- catches the blood once they slaughter. Of course, yeah. And that's not that's that's the clay shows that he mentioned the distant? serving vessel that he oh, mentioned. Okay. And how distant is that from the, the altar outside? Well, they had to they had a line of kohanim that would stand, they would stand right next to each other, and they would hand it one coin would hand it to the other, and that's how they would. Uh, but how far the from the depends what korban it was. Some korbanos were down closer to the mizbeach, the shechita. Some korbanos were more distant from the mizbeach. Um, but halachically, you're allowed to walk with it, and 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 then you give it to a kohen that he pours the blood, or you yourself pours the blood. In general, we learned there are four th- things that are being done: the, the shechita, the receiving of the blood, the walking with it, and then the throwing it. And is this Rabbi Shimon by your head ever? Rabbi Shimon? Yes, I think it was Rabbi Shimon Gamliel. Rabbi Shimon, the son of Gamliel. And then where they put the blood, never can put it on the floor, because the, the thing was like this, the ball was like this. It's a pointy, a pointy vessel. Anyway, um, the Mishnah rules that when both the parent and the offspring are kochim, and are slaughtered in the temple courtyard, the second slaughterer incurs Malchus, obviously because he violated the prohibition of Oyes of Esbenoi. The Gemara wonders why this is the only violation for which he is punished. But let him also incur lashes on account of violating the prohibition of slaughtering an offering that is Mechus Azman. It says Mechus Azman, we learned that uh, the Torah is explicitly prohibit in 12, it's written, the Torah does, the, uh, does not explicitly prohibit slaughtering an offering that is mechus azman, that it's not the proper time. Rather, it teaches that if a mechus azman <coughs> is sacrificed, the sacrifice is not acceptable to God. So that would be like something that you have to sh- do tomorrow, right? Right. But if you did it today. Like uh, a... Korban Pesach. Korban Pesach, that was not done on time. There is, however, not not pigul. There is, however, a general prohibition against bringing in any offering that has that has been disqualified, whatever the reason for its disqualification. Not only bringing it up on the altar, but even its slaughter is prohibited. One who slaughters a mechusas man for the sake of offering is ought to incur malchus for this violation. In addition to the malchus, he incurs for the violation of Ois of Esbenoi. Uh, Sita Yoschaim will explain why the Gemara introduces this question at this uh, juncture. But let him also incur lashes on account of uh, violating the prohibition of slaughtering an offering that is Mechus Azman, the Tanya, for it was taught in a Baisa 
From where is it derived regarding all the unfit animals among the cattle and among the sheep and goats? That one who offers them is subject to the law of it is not acceptable. Talmud Lema, Vesheu, Vesesawa, Vekolot Vegem. Scripture therefore states, and an ox, or a se, that has one limb longer than the other, or unsplit hooves, etc., it is not acceptable for a vow offering. Limed al hapsulin shebesheu vebeseshu beloi rotze. This teaches regarding all the unfit animals among the cattle, among the sheep and goats that one who offers them is subject to the law of, it is not acceptable, since a mechus, since a mechusar zman is unfit to be offered, one who slaughters it has violated a prohibition for which he incurs malchus. Why does the Mishnah state that the second slaughterer incurs only 40 lashes when he actually incurs 80? So it's a mechusar's man, and it's oisov es benoi. Kiko, kika choshiv. So, I just want to look at 16 for a second. He is liable on to uh, one set of markers because he violated the prohibition of oisov es benoi, and another set because he violated the prohibition it is not acceptable, which applies to the slaughter of a mechusas man, something that is not being done on the right time. Uh, kika, that's, uh, that's the Maharam. Sorry. It's, it's interesting, I don't know whether I learned it in Gemara or not, that anything that touches the, the Mizbeach, even, even if it falls into the categories that we're just talking about, mechusas man, Lo yore, they don't take it down, even though it's a possible Right, they learn it in Zvachim, yes. On the Mizbeach, they, they leave it there. Right. It doesn't come down. There's certain cases that do come down, specific cases that we learned in Zvachim, that uh, unique cases, yeah, unique cases that uh, they do come down. Yeah. But generally not. Generally not, no. Kika Choshi, when the Mishnah list uh, the Marcus lashes that are incurred, it deals only with those incurred on account of violations. What is the violation of it and its offerings? It does not list the lashes that are incurred of extraneous violations that are committed simultaneously. That's a lot of lashes to be racking up. Can't, uh, according to Jewish law, you can't get... Uh, more lashes that you can handle. They, they just over here mentioning the maximum amount of lashes, which, which was 39. They call it 40, but the really was, reality was 39. But for someone to incur lashes, he had to go to be examined by a doctor, and the doctor would say, well, how much his body can take? And if he can take five, they would give him three. If he can take, always, it has to be an a odd number. Mm -hmm. So they would always take the, l the lesser number. If you say he can take uh, 10 lashes, it would give him, uh, uh, I think, uh, 9. Yeah. It couldn't give him uh, one more. It could only be with one hand. There's a lot of rules when it comes to these things. It's not so uh, simple. The love, the loy, this is not. Kika choshi, lave de oiso es benoi, lave necho loy kachoshi. It does not list the lashes that are incurred for extraneous violations that are committed simultaneously. Veloi, but does it not list the lashes for extraneous violations? But consider the case where the parent and offspring are both kochim and are slaughtered outside the temple courtyard. For the violations for which lashes are incurred are extraneous violations. Vekachoshiv, and yet the Mishnah lists them. The Ketoni for the Mishnah states, Kochim Vachutz, if the animal and its offspring that are slaughtered on one day are both Kochim and are slaughtered outside the courtyard, Harishon Chav Kores, the first slaughter is liable to Kores Ushneim. So if you can boim, and both this, of the slaughterers incur the 40 lashes of Malkis. 
It is, un, it is understandable that the second slaughter incurs Marcus because he has violated the prohibition of Oisoi ve'es benoi, it and its offspring. El arishon o ma'isoifik, but as for the first one, why does he incur Marcus? Lav mishum, lav deshchut echut. It is not obviously because he has violated the prohibition of offerings slaughtered outside the courtyard. The Mishnah does list extraneous violations. Question mark. Clearly, it says in 18, clearly he is not punished on account of Oisav es Benoi, since only the second slaughter violated this prohibition. Perforce his Malchus come because he slaughtered an offering outside the courtyard. So we see that the Mishnah does mention other violations. The Gemara responds, Kol Eich Adelei Kalav Da Oisav es Benoi, Choshiv Lavi Nichroi. Vechol Eich Adei Kalav Da Oisav es Benoi, Loi Choshiv Lavi Nichroi. Wherever there is no violation of Oisav Es Benoi, the Mishnah lists extraneous violation. But wherever there is violation of it and its offspring, the Mishnah does not list extraneous violations. And number 19, it says the Mishnah is focused primarily on the law of Oisav Es Benoi, like the name of this chapter. And accordingly, in any case where a person has violated this prohibition, it disregards any other violations. Only in a case where he has not violated Oisov Es Benoi does it mention the Marcus for a different violation. Rabbi Zeir Omar, the Gemara presents an alternative answer to the original question of why the Mishnah omits the Marcus for slaughtering a Mechus Azman. Rabbi Zeir Omar, Hanach le Mechus Azman, set aside the issue of Mechus Azman, one does not incur Marcus for slaughtering it. Why? The Kosov because scripture has removed it from the category of a prohibition to the, to the category of a positive commandment. My time. What is the reason where has scripture done this? Where did scripture remove it from the category of prohibition to the, to the category of positive commandment? For the scripture state, when an ox or a sheep or a goat is born from the eighth day on, it is acceptable for a fire offering to Hashem. From the eighth day, the verse implies that from the eighth day on, yes, it is acceptable. But therefore, the eighth day is not acceptable. From the implication of the positive commandment to make an offering, in its proper time, we derive a restriction against making it before its proper time. And a prohibition that is derived through the implication of a positive commandment is considered a positive commandment for which one does not incur malchus. It says in uh, number four, just I'm going to read uh, part of it. It says, Malchus are incurred only for the violation of a negative commandment but not for the violation of a prohibition that is inferred from a positive commandment. By stating a specific positive commandment that implies a restriction against offering a mechus azman, the Torah removed the mechus azman from the general prohibition of it, for of it, it, it is not acceptable, lo yirotze, which pertains to all unspecified offerings that are not fit, and made it subject only to the specific restriction the slaughter of a Mechus Azman does not make a person liable to Marcus because the, the, the Mechus Azman is connected with a positive commandment, not with a negative commandment. So you only have um, Marcus for a violation of a negative, negative commandment. Yeah.